All right. Acronyms, y'all. I don't know what your H-I-M-L-L-C's are. That's tip number one. Let's <laughs> people outside maybe don't know what those acronyms are. acronyms are. I see a lot of different folks in here. This is great. Grad in mathematics, physics, chemistry, marketing, chemistry, anthro. All right, Aditi, you're defending this month. Congratulations. That's amazing. Um, and excited to move on to non-academic careers, DEI, workforce development. You've been applying for jobs for a while, but this market has been hard. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Anesthesiology, biomedical, special education, all right, I see a lot of different departments and folks that are coming in, people are just dropping what department you're coming from and maybe why you're here. I'm looking into options for post-graduation, materials engineering, public health, kinesiology. Um, Emily, thanks for sharing this. I know that I'm on the job market, but I prefer, I, I prefer an industry job. <laughs> so I'm getting close to the end. So you're the right place. Amazing. Well, we can keep dropping those in. Um, and like, thanks so much to everybody for being here um, today. I know when Cindy's back, we'll probably, we're probably going to get started. While we're waiting, um, I know we're going to introduce our amazing panelists. So I'm joining us in a second. Uh, but maybe if you have any pre-questions that you came to this panel with, maybe we can drop them in here so that we, we have a sense of like questions that you have um, already going into this. So go ahead and drop those. This is, uh, Muhammad. thank you for asking, PhD and master students. This is for everybody. This is a general information uh, panel. So this is for everybody. So if you have questions you're coming in here with, you're thinking of, and maybe as you're, as we're, as our panelists are talking today, you'll be coming up with questions. You're welcome to, to be dropping them in the chat. And Cindy, when you're back, we will get started. Hopefully soon. All right. I think we're looking, we're looking. Okay. Okay. Right. <laughs> I had to resend, resend the link. So You're I good. want to make sure I sent the right link. Okay. All right. All right. So welcome everyone. Thanks so much for being here. This is an exciting program we have for you today. We we look forward to a lot of great information. We have some great panelists here today. Uh, we have um, uh, Jason from Fermi Labs, uh, Devin who will be uh, from MacArthur Foundation, which, who will be joining us shortly, Marie from the Field Museum of Chicago, and Heidi from Avvi. Uh, and I'll have each one of uh, the panelists introduce themselves, their uh, full name, of course, and their title. And uh, then we'll go, we'll each in, have each introduce themselves, and then uh, we will then start with Marie to talk about uh, information from the Field Museum. So um, Marie, if you want to go ahead and, and start with uh, your own introduction and then we'll go on to Jason and then Heidi and then Devin. Sure, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Marie Georg. I am a senior exhibition developer at the Field Museum. I've been working at the Field Museum for 17 years now. Um, primarily in exhibition development, but for a short time in project management before that. Um, I went to Washington and St. Louis and had an undergraduate degree in anthropology and a master's in museum studies from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, so for a little bit of background, um, let me put up my slides. Um, hold on a second. Maria. Um, I think real quick, we're going to do introductions and then we'll come back and do, yeah, presentations. Does that sound good? <laughs> All right. Cindy, who's next? Unmute myself first. Jason? <laughs> Hi. So I'm uh, Jason Krinkovic. Um, I work at Fermi Lab. I'm what they call an applications physicist. Um, I work in the um, acceleration, accelerator uh, directorate. Um, before that, I was a postdoc working on uh, what's called the muon GMS2 experiment at Fermi Lab. Um, I've only been an employee approaching a couple of years now, but it's, it's normal at um, DOE labs to have 
um, what we call visitors, so non-employees spend a lot of time uh, helping out with the experiments that are occurring at the lab. And so I actually moved, was it to Frame Lab in 2016, actually. So I've been around for a while, even though I wasn't an employee. Um, and so I have a, um, a PhD um, in high energy physics from uh, the University of Illinois at Brandeis Champaign. And, um, and that's who I am. Okay, and then Heidi. Hi everyone, um, I'm Heidi Oldenkamp. I work at Abbey. I actually work at the Irvine, California location. So I'm in between LA and San Diego over on the West Coast. I've been at Abbey. Um, I started in June of 2022. So almost a year and a half now. And this is my first job after finishing my PhD. I got a PhD um, in May of 2022 um, from the University of Texas at Austin in chemical engineering. Um, before my PhD, I got my bachelor's at Oregon State in bioengineering. So, yep. Okay, we're waiting on, on Devin and um, in fact, Devin. I'm going to excuse myself. I, I'm going to try to reach him. Uh, reach Devin. Her. Oh. I'm Devin. here. <laughs> oh, <great. laughs> Hi, Devin. I'm here. Devin. Hi. <laughs> so sorry about that. I was having trouble getting in. So thank you all for your patience and having me uh, here today. Uh, my name is Devin Money. I know the name looks a little funny. They're like, it cannot be money. It must be something else. Like, no, no, it's money like cash. Um, I joke that I'm an HR professional by day, rapper and DJ by night. Um, but I uh, am uh, the manager of talent acquisition for the MacArthur Foundation. Um, I have been with the organization for it'll be three years next week. Um, I earned my undergraduate degree from DePaul and my master's degree from Keller Business School. Um, I've spent the last, oh my gosh, almost 15 years um, in HR. Uh, but the bulk of my my time, of course, I've spent, you know, uh, doing a little bit of everything within HR, but my specialty has always been recruiting. Um, and I'm very fortunate to be with, here with you all today. Thank you for, for having me. All right, great. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to start or go back to Marie uh, to please uh, talk about uh, Field Museum. Uh, or I'm sorry, uh, with... Uh, Yes, <laughs> uh, and, and just uh, please take take the stage. Thank you. Sure. Um, I have slides, but um, slide sharing is disabled for me right now, but I'm happy to get started without them. You need to do something in the background for that. Um, so uh, I think it makes sense to just start with um, just a little bit about the Field Museum and what the Field Museum does for anyone who is I'm sure. So the Field Museum is a large natural history museum in downtown Chicago. The overall staff has about 500 to 600 people on staff, which is a huge, huge number of people with a whole lot of different jobs inside the museum. So my plan today is to mostly talk about my own position and positions adjacent to mine in exhibitions, but I also am going to touch on just sort of the existence and basic functions of some jobs throughout the institution that people may not be aware of you know, how many, how many jobs go into, into a museum. So I'm going to try one more time for screen sharing, see if it's enabled. It'll oh, be enabled. Oh, Let me know. Yep. Okay, cool. Yes, it is now. Okay, there we go. All right, so just starting with me, exhibition developer. So I'm sure many of you have been to museum exhibitions before, but you probably have not thought about all the people that it takes to put them together. So um, I work on lots of projects, both nature and culture topics. So I'm not specifically tied to a particular topic, even though my own background is more in physical anthropology and um, paleontology originally. Um, I've worked on shows that are about the ancient Greeks, um, color in nature, Antarctic dinosaurs, it could be anything. So really the specialty is more in science communication. So as an exhibition developer, whenever the museum has decided we're gonna do a particular exhibition on a particular topic, you know, it could be, you know, let's say color in nature or um, archeology span of Southeastern Europe or whatever it might be, 
Um, the exhibition developers are assigned to be the main contact person with our scientific staff. So the people who are the scientists, the anthropologists, um, biologists, et cetera, who are the experts in their field. And our job is to work with them to figure out um, some main components for the exhibition, put together an object list, put together the text for the exhibition, figure out the pictures, all of that kind of stuff, and the main messages and the basic story that the exhibition is going to tell. So part of what we bring to this process um, is enough of having been through the academic process to understand kind of where the scientists are coming from, but enough distance from the topic too to still be able to speak for visitors and the visitor experience. What do most people know about this? What do most people not know about this? What are people going to find compelling and interesting? Um, what are what will need to be explained? Um, what about which objects just like look cool? <laughs> you know, sometimes after it's been a while, um, people who are specialists start to kind of lose that distance and uh, and understanding. Um, so just here on some pictures are just some a couple of the steps in our process. So we've got our text documents, the process of picking out objects for an exhibition. And then a lot of it has to do with um, organizing the information for our designers. So I'm not the one who draws the exhibition. I'm not the one who lays out the text. I'm the one who is figuring out the content structure and organization so that then I can pass that on to our design team and collaborate with them. They're the ones who have also been in, you know, gone to art school and things like that. And they're the ones who are actually creating the exhibition. Um, so we're gonna go through a lot of the team members from exhibitions here. Um, so exhibition designers. So they're the ones that they're gonna be putting together things like floor plans. So you can see here's a floor plan. They're the ones that are putting together case layout. So if I've come up with a collection of objects with the curator, that we think could go together in the exhibition, the designer is the one who actually figures out like, how are we gonna display it? How is it gonna be arranged? How will visitors see it? Um, they'll figure out the floor plan following the storyline that I've put together to figure out how visitors will move through the space, et cetera. So exhibition designers typically um, will have a background. Most of them have gone to more of like an art school, design school, that kind of thing. There are some, um, uh, specialty programs. Um, Blue, bring it here. Pardon? Oh, never mind. So, um, whereas most of the developers um, typically have sort of arts and sciences backgrounds is more typical. So the exhibition developers um, in recent past in our staff, we have people, a lot of anthropology degrees, history, English literature, journalism, um, art education, um, early childhood education, um, and then some also on the sciences, like I can think of somebody who was a dual major French and chemistry, um, also uh, another paleontology, former paleontologist, et cetera. So in the exhibition development side of things, what, what tends to stand out is actually people that have had um, exposure to multiple disciplines is really, really useful. So that in and of itself, we're more likely to pay attention to candidates who um, who have like that French chemistry major. So somebody who can kind of operate in multiple worlds and demonstrate their ability to talk to different kinds of people and different kinds of scientists. Like that is one of the core skills for us in exhibition development, that ability to like think about different kinds of visitors, different kinds of science, different kinds of topics, different ways to talk about things, different ways to communicate them. So sometimes just seeing that combination of multiple disciplines can be um, a way for exhibition developers to stand out. Um, whereas design, it tends to be more people who have gone through a more um, standardized art school type rigorous post undergraduate career. Um, we also have another important role in our exhibition teams who are project managers. Um, so a lot of the project managers also have arts and sciences backgrounds actually. Um, so a variety of uh, a variety of majors. I know some of our current current um, people have come from also had had a stint in education or other other industries. but um, project managers, their main purpose is to coordinate everybody else. So they're trying to make sure that the developers 
the designers and the production people are all talking to each other. They're all communicating with each other. They were all staying on time, all staying on budget. This is like an example <laughs> of a bud or of sorry of a Gantt chart schedule of the kinds of things that are our project managers are thinking about how like all the different pieces work together. So a lot of them are, are drawing on <laughs> maybe their arts and sciences backgrounds of just thinking about how do you accomplish a really large project? How do you make all the pieces of something flow together so it all times out right at the end? That kind of a thing. So um, project management's another, another whole field that exists both in the museum industry and then of course in tons and tons of industries. Um, so other careers specifically in our edu in our exhibitions department, um, we have exhibition production. Um, most of the people in production are coming from um, either more of the like, we'll say actually like construction production side, but we also have a lot of people that come from art world too. So people that may have gone to art school and studied painting or sculpture or something like that. And now they're working at the Field Museum working on mounts or painting backgrounds or things like that. So it's another, you know, for if I'm not sure if we have art, art type students out here too as well, but just to say another um, industry um, that hires a lot of artists as well. Um, we have um, traveling exhibition sales and operations. So many of the exhibitions that we create, um, we then rent to other museums. So that's how you see an exhibition kind of touring around the country sometimes. Um, we have a whole team of people that are dedicated to um, telling other museums about the exhibitions we've created as part of sales and going to conferences and things like that, telling other museums about our exhibitions. Um, and, uh, and then once other museums have decided they do want to rent our exhibitions, taking care of all the operations of actually making it happen. So figuring out, you know, the schedules, figuring out the logistics of getting in the installation people in there. So again, it's kind of a, like a project management, like putting all the pieces together to get something done, <laughs> you know, um, which I will say, this is more of a comment for interns. I also supervise a lot of interns. I know you guys are further along than that, but a lot of times when I'm talking to interns and looking for experiences, even if it's somewhat limited of what I think can be applicable, I always ask them, like, can you tell me about a time that you worked with a team to make something happen or get something done? Because at the end of the day, like a lot of, you know, in the museum industry, it's about like, you just have to make it happen at the end of the day. So like a lot of the crossover fields that have that aspect to it are like theater, you know, putting on a show. Like, are you, have you been part of a team that made it happen on opening night and the show went on? <laughs> like, that's an important skill or, um, you know, a lot of event planning. So like thinking about like, whether your event guests can be kind of analogous to museum visitors, thinking about like, did they know where to show up? Did they show up on time? Were they comfortable? Were like, did all the steps happen in sequence such that your event kind of was pulled off? And I know sometimes um, when I'm talking to internship candidates, they don't always think of those experiences they had with like their clubs and hobbies right away that sometimes can be really applicable to what our position is of like, especially things related to like, like I said, like theater and event planning and things like that. A lot of times the clubs and um, hobbies will have a lot of those experiences that can be relevant, especially to like that project management, like having a success, <laughs> getting stuff done and having had those experiences that like, if you didn't plan well, it you find out. <laughs> like I like, I prefer if people have found out that like their planning didn't go well. <laughs> so, um, and I love to hear about when people, if they have done any sort of event planning or putting on a show, I like to ask, um, you know, what didn't go well and what would you do better next time? Because there's always something. So hopefully that they were able to reflect on that and think about what went better, could go better next time. Um, <clears throat> exhibition registrar is another position we have that I think a lot of the people in that position came from arts and sciences education backgrounds, especially like art history and things like that. So the registrars are the ones who um, have to deal with the object. Like if I decide that an object belongs in a show, 
there's a lot that needs to happen to make that actual museum object get into the case. So registrars are the people who, um, let's say it's a loaned art piece for another museum. The registrars, they have to do all the paperwork for shipping and insurance and like condition reporting and like liability and like all the stuff that needs to happen for transportation and protection of the object in order to make an agreement with another museum to make that object actually come to our museum. Um, so a lot of the registrars have backgrounds in art history or because um, there are a lot of art, um, art registrars just in terms of positions, a lot of them out there. So a lot of them start out kind of more in the world adjacent to anthropology or art history and they end up becoming registrars for the objects that are related to that field. Um, and really the registrars, um, it comes from, you know, a background of extreme detail orientedness and, and willingness to pay attention to paperwork really, really well. But in the end, it's, it's getting these objects from museum to museum safely. Um, so that's definitely a place to look as well. Um, we have whole other departments in the museum outside of exhibitions. So we have an entire learning center at our museum and many, many museums up around the country. So a learning center tends to have um, people that are working on school programs, family programs, public learning programs, youth initiatives, volunteer managers. And I would say all of these people would have had backgrounds in arts and sciences type um, educational fields. So um, a lot of them have um, may or may not have actual like teaching certifications, um, but perhaps um, combine this with some sort of like education, early education type stuff. But they're now working as educators in the museum for lots of different kinds of audiences. A lot of them are people that are interested in, you know, educating, but not necessarily classroom educating. So um, there are, you know, many different kinds of programs and educators um, at lots of museums. Um, institutional advancement is another department. Um, it's a really fancy way of saying fundraising, money, money raising. Um, so our institutional advancement um, department has a lot of jobs with, with people. Some of them have like more business degrees, but some of them I know also have arts and sciences type degrees. So people that work in fundraising, event planning, but also grant writers. So like my, actually my boss at the Field Museum, director of exhibition development, his first job at the Field Museum was as a grant writer. So he had a degree in English and he started working in institutional advancement as a grant writer um, and then eventually worked his way over into exhibition development many years ago. Um, but that's another area where you can put your writing skills to use, um, not just at the museum, but lots of nonprofits, lots of institutions have grant writers. Um, so you need to be able to sort of use your academic skills to process new information, write it write it in a way, think about your audience um, in a way that will hopefully get your organization some money. Um, and then of course, we also have lots of membership programs that are kind of similar to, in some ways to the, um, the programs for um, families and schools and audiences that uh, basically just involves planning, using skills um, and enough of a background of kind of getting, getting the job done. Um, science in action is um, probably what you most are likely thinking of if you're thinking, oh, somebody who works in a museum, the first thing you're gonna think of might be curator. Um, so I'm actually not gonna talk about the curators very much because um, the curator's jobs are academic appointments. So if we're talking about sort of non-academic jobs, um, but there are other jobs in our science in action um, center that are alongside the curators. So, Examples of those positions would be um, collections managers um, and our action center programs. So a collection manager is a person in a museum who um, is primarily responsible for care of collection objects. So a lot of the collections managers are people with um, academic degrees in the areas related to the collections they're managing, but then they have, it's not an academic appointment like a curator. So um, sometimes there's crossover in some museums between collection managers and registrars as well. Um, in some institutions, they're literally the same functions in one job. Other institutions, they're separate jobs. Um, but it's it's a kind of a similar thing if you're interested in more of a more of a, a job related to the objects as opposed to an academic appointment 
um, involving the field, we'll say. Um, so collection managers um, are very knowledgeable about like the objects and how they could potentially be degraded or damaged, trying to protect them, organizing the collection, figuring out how to, um, you know, they approve loans of the objects to other institutions, et cetera. Um, and then they also work with exhibitions and helping us um, select objects potentially for use in our exhibitions. Um, the Action Center um, is a field museum particular thing, but you may find similar jobs in other institutions. Um, it has to do with um, kind of like working, it's kind of advocacy work, or a lot of them are like programs to help teens in Chicago learn about nature or something like that would be an example of some of our Action Center programs. And a lot of the people in those programs, again, are have, um, are coming from arts and sciences backgrounds. Um, I did want to note just some resources for job seekers, specifically in the museum industry. So the place I would definitely start is looking at individual museum websites, um, but there's other places to look as well. There's the American Association of, or I'm sorry, the ESP Association, American Alliance of Museums, AAM, has a conference every year. It's a professional organization. They also have a job board. Um, Aztec is another association for science and technology centers. Again, they have a yearly conference. They have a website, resources, and a job board. Um, ICOM, same thing, International Council of Museums, but that's for museums worldwide. Um, also, just to point out, don't forget to look up the National Park Service. So there are a lot of museums that are National Park Service units. And so you would want to look at the job boards for federal governments in the National Park Service um, specific things. So there's a lot of, we'll say, office jobs in the National Park Service too, if you're not necessarily inter interested in being a park ranger, but there are museum collections type jobs in the National Park Service. Um, and then there's also the private sector. There are experienced design firms, um, some of which work both on commercial projects and museum projects. So a field museum is so big that we can have our own in-house art um, exhibitions department, but a lot of institutions are too small for that. So they might um, hire an experienced design firm. So there are also jobs there at those um, at those firms. So I think that that's the end of my slide. Okay, Marie, thank you so much for getting us started. Uh, great information. Thank you so much for sharing. For uh, all those in attendance, if you could hold your questions to the end, we will have time to address any of the questions you may have. Uh, all right, so we'll now turn the, the stage over to uh, Jason from Fermi Labs. Jason, please uh, please go ahead. Let me... Okay. Um, so, okay. So I was thinking about, you know, what talk I should give and, um, you know, the goals that I have for this talk is I, you know, I wanted to emphasize um, that there's a lot more uh, going on at Fermi Lab than just um, high energy physics research. And, um, you know, I say that because, you know, for instance, my own personal story, you know, begins in high energy physics and sort of ends up an accelerator. And, and, and the issue with science often is the research gets very specialized very fast. So, um, you know, I'm gonna try and give a talk where I, I throw a whole bunch of stuff at you um, and basically please ask questions because, you know, there's a lot of pieces in here. There's a lot of opportunities, um, you know, for people with a graduate degree that isn't just, you know, graduate student, postdoc scientist at the lab. Okay, so that's, that's trying, you know, that's what I'm trying to emphasize here, <clears throat> right? Um, and so that's why, you know, a lot of the science is basically dependent on non-scientific positions in various ways, directly and indirectly. Um, I also wanted to point out, you know, I know this is for, you know, non-academic um, opportunities, but, you know, again, the way the, the the research works is you're often working with graduate students and closely with, with um, universities and things like that. Um, and so I, I do want to point out that, you know, if you are interested in working sort of with students that really are um, teaching opportunities, you know, in limited ways, not the way you would as a professor and working with students as well. Um, <clears throat> and so also I wanted to, um, you know, make the point that, um, again, you know, for some people it's going to make sense to try and get a, a, a job at the university or 
get a job right out of university at the lab. But also keep in mind, you know, Fermilab might make sense to you later in your career, depending on what you're doing. Um, so, you know, always, you know, if you, if you think, you know, if you find fundamental scientific research interesting and you would like to help support it in some way, you know, you don't have to do that right away. You can, you know, you can go off and do other things and come back, back to it and help support it. <clears throat> so, you know, a lot of what I'm, I'm going to be sort of um, focusing on is, you know, potential research type jobs, which could be, you know, um, physics types jobs, engineering or um, computer science type jobs. Um, and, you know, specifically, I'm, I'm talking about Fermilab because that's where I am. But a lot of what I'm saying basically also applies to the other DOE labs um, out there. And so, as I was already kind of alluding to, um, you know, I'm going to quickly go over a whole bunch of stuff <laughs> um, because, again, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, cast a wide net because I know there's a lot of people with a lot of very different backgrounds here um, than, um, you know, just again, high energy physics research. Um, and so, I want to try to, you know, make it apparent that there could be a place for you at the lab, basically. <clears throat> and so, if something catches your eye, um, please let me know and I'm happy to answer questions about it. <clears throat> okay. So, what's the different kinds of research going on at Fermilab, right? So as I already mentioned, there's this high energy physics research. Another name for that is, is um, particle physics. Um, and it's really hard to do uh, particle physics without accelerators because accelerators basically take charged particles and gives them a lot of energy and then you smash them into things and then you measure things. And that's you know a quick summary of what particle physics is. Um, but you, know, you, you also kind of need more than that. There's also um, the applied um, physics and superconducting uh, technology um, area of the lab. Um, this has, a, you know, is originally uh, driven by the fact that accelerators are basically based on, made out of a bunch of magnets. Um, and so you have to, you know, be good at building magnets. And then, you know, once you produce all this data from these experiments, you got to figure out how to like, you know, collect it, process it, store it, analyze it, move it around. Um, and so that's why computational science and, and now artificial intelligence is becoming um, more and more important um, in this, in these areas of, of research. And then also, you know, the lab is thinking about the future. Um, and so there's some emerging technologies um, that the lab would like to expand into. A lot of this is related to quantum information science. So first I'll sort of kind of quickly go over um, the particle physics part of, of the lab. Um, and obviously it's a lot of uh, particle physics, but I also wanted to just take a moment um, and point out that, you know, this naturally connects into astrophysics of so, you know, if you're interested in astrophysics, there's also that part of it as well. Um, also, too, um, you know, if you if you are interested in high energy physics, um, they do have a, a lot of work that they also do with stuff going on at CERN. So, you know, you can still work at Fermilab and actually do the type of physics um, that's out at CERN if you're interested in that as well. But, you know, more broadly speaking, um, again, you know, less science related jobs, um, you know, in 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 particle physics research, you know, most things are custom. So even if they're made out of commercial um, stuff that, you know, you can, you can buy, it's still sort of custom packaged and put together and all that. And so there really is lots and lots of um, engineering opportunities. Um, you know, if you're basically, you're an engineer, right? Cause you still, you know, you have to build these things, they have to reliably work, they have to safely work, all that stuff, right? They can't catch fire, things like that, right? So, um, you know, you, you can fit into, for instance, you know, detector development is very important. And yeah, you can fit into it as a scientist, but you can fit into that, you know, as an engineer or a technician, things like that, right? It takes a whole group of people with different skills to, you know, build an actual detector system that will reliably work. So um, just um, mention it, you know, an important part of the, the physics program going forward for the lab is, is neutrino physics. I won't explain that because uh, that's its own discussion. <laughs> but um, if you're interested in neutrino physics, Fermilab is the place to come and do it. I'll just leave it at that. So um, as I was mentioning before, um, it's it's hard to do sort of modern um, particle physics or high energy physics uh, without accelerators because that that's how you get the high energy particles to do the physics um, measurements. And so <clears throat> the lab has. Um, you know, a large chunk of the lab is, is focused on, you know, building and operating and improving accelerators. And so, um, you know, again, there's, there's, you know, just to run an accelerator, which is a big complicated machine, um, since they are so big, you know, they're expensive to make, you don't build a new one every year, right? So, you know, just maintaining it, um, you know, is a big deal. And so, again, you know, you know, you need scientists, you need engineers, you need technicians, um, <clears throat> even, um, 
you know, they have also what we call um, engineering physicists. So often, um, you know, they, they can have a very huge wide range of backgrounds, let's say. Um, so a lot of them in, in the accelerator um, part of the lab, they'll, they'll begin as operators who operate the machines, right? But eventually they'll do more um, sort of research side things. And so they'll, they'll transition out of operations and become um, engineering physicists and, you know, they'll help build and maintain and improve uh, these systems. <clears throat> And so, you know, again, if you're or if you're more interested in, let's say, the the computer science sort of things or computers in general, um, again, to you know, run a big complicated um, object that could be decades old <laughs> requires very good control systems. And so, this is what this Acorn stuff here is on the on the right hand side. Um, you know, so you know, just building, you know, just how to control such a system requires a lot of work, um, and you can be work, you know, not just programming, but figuring out how to talk to and communicate. I run, you know, specialized hardware. That's a very common feature with um, the controls as well. So, um, <clears throat> so, uh, oh, I forgot to mention as well. So another thing too. So if you're, um, if you're, you know, one very sort of interesting area, I would say specifically um, that might have sort of broader appeal to people is is the target systems. And so, um, you know. At its core, you, you know, Fermilab basically takes a bunch of protons, gives them a bunch of energy, and slams it into something called a target. And then the target produces more particles that you do your physics experiments with. And so these targets are these very, um, you know, extreme sort of conditions because, you know, they're, you know, receiving lots of, of um, high energy particles. So they have radiation issues, you know, they have, they have thermal issues. And so, you know, again, from, a, from an engineering point of view, you know, mechanical engineering point of view, there's a lot of um, you know interesting research going on, as well as material science. So if you're interested in things like you know material science and chemistry, this might also be an area uh, that might interest you, um, because again, you know you kind of have to get it right the first time. Because when things break, um, sometimes you you know it's not even practical to fix it. You have to replace it. It's expensive to replace it, and so a lot of you know thought and care has to go into getting it all right. Um, and so that's figuring out you know the materials that it will work. Um, and like I said, under a range of, of sort of extreme uh, conditions. And so then, yeah, so just um, in, in general, um, again, to maintain these, these, these large, you know, the large accelerator complex, basically you need all sorts of, of engineering and technical support um, as well. Um, and then also I wanted to point out too, you know, since accelerators are so specialized, there is a lot of, um, you know, actually education emphasis more than you might think. So actually Fermilab hosts um, a, a specialized master's program. And so, you know, if you're part of the accelerator, um, part of the lab, you you might um, teach courses in it. So it's, it's condensed verse. It's, it's meant to be condensed because again, you know, it's not, you know, a traditional student path, right? So it's very common for the operators who run the accelerator systems to get a master's um, in accelerator <clears throat> uh, physics. And so, you know, they have a couple of sessions, two sessions twice a year that are a couple of weeks long. So everything's very condensed. Um, and so again, you know, if you're interested in teaching, it's normal for, you know, people with all different backgrounds who, who you know, learn a specialized topic, right? Through, through work experience to teach. And then again, um, you know, there's very few, um, you know, there are a handful, but there's not many, um, you know, uh, graduate programs and accelerators. Um, as well. And so, you know, they actually also make a, an effort to have a joint university uh, Fermilab uh, PhD program. So again, you know, if you're inclined to to help mentor graduate students, there's also opportunities for that as well as, as a lab employee. Okay, so um, then there's sort of the applied physics um, and superconducting um, part of the lab. And as I mentioned previously, this sort of arose out of the need to build a bunch of magnets for these accelerators because that's that's how you control these these charged particle beams and but you know this is sort of you know grown and advanced as time has gone on um and so you know there's the traditional electromagnets um that they you know they they build and improve upon but but they've expanded a lot in superconducting uh base technology um again I won't get into the advantages and disadvantages of traditional magnets versus the superconductors, but the point is, is you know, there's again these sort of material science and chemistry type, um, you know, types of research and engineering um, that you might find interesting. Um, you might, you know, want to work on. And then, um, 
yeah let's see here okay so um so then yeah so then there's the sort of the the computational science side of things and um and again i want to um say that this is this side of things is is quite broad right so so there is the more sort of directly connected to the research part of of you know how do you take the the data from an experiment and maybe process it and analyze it but again you know this type of research you know you have very large um quantities of data okay that you need to be processed and so you know if you're you know you're getting some degree in some computer science related area um you know there's there's more of the you know science connections to the particle physics but there's also just basic you know how do you build a large database and make it work you know how do you make a you know cluster of computers work and so there's a whole sort of spectrum of projects um that you could potentially work on um that you might you know depending on what your particular interests are um you, you could probably find right so there's any for like you said you know you know something like a you know direct physics simulation of something to like i said you know how, how do you run a cluster of computers basically um and then also to this area um because right now a very sort of big active area of interest is, is quantum information science and so of course they now have um you know they're, they're expanding more and more into looking specifically into that that um area of of research and i guess i should also say too you know things like machine learning and artificial intelligence um are also becoming i think more and more prominent again if that's your your area of interest um in high energy physics um simply because you know you have just these massive data sets and you know and how do you process so that all in like a reasonable amount of time <laughs> so a graduate student can graduate basically right and get their thesis and, and move on right <clears throat> So then there's um, there's the emerging technologies area of the lab. Um, and like I said, you know, the traditional sort of area of research for the lab is high energy physics, but they want to expand out. And that that's um, largely focused on, on is what I was just mentioning uh, a few moments ago. Um, so, you know, quantum computing um, sensors, you know, quantum inter internet and networks, um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. But again, um, since there's so few places that really drive, um, you know, accelerator science, again, so this is, you know, one of the leaders of, you know, accelerator R&D basically in, in the world. Um, and then obviously too, because uh, I mentioned also, they, you know, you have to deal with these very large data sets. And so that's why a lot of, you know, efforts going into, into that research as well. But also, uh, you know, this is all basically for the most part based on electronics. And so that's why they're, they're trying to develop more uh, microelectronics. Um, so I also want to take a moment to sort of point out that, you know, if you are um, a graduate student, you're not like, you know, graduating tomorrow, um, there are graduate student sort of internship opportunities at the lab. So if you want to kind of get a sense of, you know, does this place make sense to me or not, um, there's a number of, of programs here on the left hand side. So, you know, Accelerator Engineering Fellowship uh, for Underrepresented Minorities, you know, Computational Science Graduate Fellowship. Fermilab Computational Science Internship, NSF Mathematical Science uh, Graduate Internship, Science Graduate Research Program, uh, Graduate Fellowship in Engineering and Science. And um, also there's a lot of Italians who work. <laughs> so apparently there's also an Italian student program as well. And that's actually another thing I, I probably should take a moment to, to point out that, um, again, you know, since these projects get so large and complicated and expensive, it is really an international um sort of community here um so if you know you'll meet people from around the world <laughs> um and that's actually one of the nice things about the lab um is just just um just a diverse background of people who who end up at the lab <clears throat> and then also too um again there's probably not anyone getting a degree in accelerator physics but they even like i said um because again there, there's so few opportunities or there's so few uh, degree programs. Um, there actually do. There is this joint university Fermilab doctorate um, program that you know if that's something that you are interested in transitioning in, there is sort of support, um, you know, on the lab side to help help with that as well. So, um, you know, a good place um, to to probably you know one of the best places to find these jobs because again they're often quite specialized. I know that you know the lab will advertise in different places. 
Um, but probably the simplest is to go where it's centralized. And again, this, you know, the other DOE labs, if you're interested in other positions at other DOE labs, it's going to be the same thing. And so the best probably place to look is actually at the lab website. Um, so, so if you want to find them at, at Fermilab, you just go to the main page and it, there's the jobs button at the top, you go click on, and then that'll bring you to the next page. And so you, you probably want to look at the, the job openings, the external job openings, basically. And then you'll get um, basically a list of them that you can then search. And again, you'll probably need to use the search feature because again, there's a whole, you know, there's all sorts of different jobs um, all the time that you need to, or the, the lab needs to fill all the time. And so you'll probably want to use the search feature because there's a lot of stuff you're not going to be interested in. So um, how am I doing on time? I think we, we need to wrap up on the next uh... sure. Yep, yeah, then I'll then I'll wrap up. That's fine. Thanks, Jason. So helpful. I kind of figured that was going to happen. So again, I just uh, will reiterate some things I'd like you to take away. So again, you know, there's there's actually a lot of research opportunities at the lab, not just particle physics. Uh, so keep that in mind. And you know, we need you know people with all different skills um, to actually uh, deliver that science. <clears throat> and you can still have an opportunity to teach and work with students um, if you're so inclined. And, um, you know, again, you know, this might not make sense for you to apply for a job here right now, but it could in the future. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind. Um, and like I said, what I, what I said, you know, the details will be different, but basically this sort of applies to the wider Dewey complex of, of labs. So. All right. Thank you so much, Jason. And uh, that was so helpful to see the wider range of possibilities when we think of one, one or two possible jobs, but there are so many. Uh, Cindy, did you want to mention who's going next? Okay. So our thank you again, Jason. Uh, excellent information. Uh, I had no idea. This is just, uh, again, very, very informative. Thank you. All right. Our next wonderful panelist is Heidi from uh, Abvi. Please uh, take the stage. It's all yours. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I don't have any uh, slides to present, but I have uh, some notes on the side here. So if you see me looking over to the side, it's just I'm referring to my notes. But um, as a lot of you probably know, because of their presence in the Chicago area, um, AbbVie is a global pharmaceutical company. So we take um, drugs all the way from discovering the molecules that could be used as drugs all the way through clinical trials and then launching them as products that are sold on the market. So it's very broad all the way across the development process for drugs. Um, and I'm here specifically representing um, our development sciences organization. So this is an organization that's within our R&D um, function. So there's many different levels to the, the organization structure, but development sciences essentially takes um, molecules that have been identified by our discovery group um, and then tries to transform those molecules into a medicine. So we take uh, them through clinical trials into the manufacturing site, develop them, make sure that they're safe and effective for patients, and then um, help them submit regulatory filings for approval. So it's a, a pretty broad, broad scope within development sciences, um, but there's six different locations that actually um, have development sciences employees for AbbVie. So there's two locations in the Chicago area. Um, they're both technically in North Chicago, but we have what we call our North Chicago location, which is our headquarters. And then we have our Abbott Park location, which is only about 10 minutes away. Um, but those hold a vast majority of our development sciences employees. And then we also have people in uh, Massachusetts, about one hour from Boston in Western Massachusetts. Um, we have people in Irvine, where I work, in Southern California. We also have people in the Bay Area of California in South San Francisco. And we have a development sciences group also in Germany, in uh, Ludwigshafen, in Germany, which is between Frankfurt and Stuttgart. So there's a wide variety of locations that you can work um, in DevSci specifically, but um, if you work in a different organization, there's even more sites because AbbVie is all across the world. Um, 
So as I mentioned during our introductions uh, previously, I came to AbbVie about a year and a half ago after finishing my PhD. Um, and I work in the small molecule drug product development group. I'm specifically um, working on mostly eye care projects. So I'm developing formulations and manufacturing processes for mostly topical ophthalmic drugs. So eye drops for the most part. Um, and those are both over the counter and prescription products for different eye conditions. So um, I've been working on this for the whole time I've been at Abbey so far. And it's been really interesting because I didn't have my PhD research in this specific area. So it just goes to show that what you research in graduate school isn't necessarily specifically what you have to do if you enter industry as a scientist. So I think that's pretty important. Um, like I said previously, um, generally the drug development process goes from drug, drug discovery, then goes into preclinical development. So before we um, introduce the potential drugs into human patients, we test them in non-human patients first um, to make sure that they're, they're safe um, in that way. And then after that demonstrated safety and efficacy, then we go into phase one, two, and three clinical trials. Um, and then eventually product launch if all of the data points towards success and it's approved by the regulatory agencies. So within development sciences, there's different organizations that focus on different um, types of drugs and also different parts of the development process. So I'm just gonna go over them briefly and then I'll talk about um, the types of jobs that most entry-level masters and PhD graduates um, are probably gonna be looking for within DevSci. So within DevSci, we kind of split it into um, biological and small molecule drugs. So if you're working on a graduate degree in um, science, you probably know a bit about this, but there's some big differences between small molecule and biological drugs. So it's kind of segregated into two areas. Um, so within biologics, we have development biological sciences, which focuses more on the early stage development for biological drugs. So this is looking at drug absorption and metabolism distribution, um, and a lot of the preclinical pre safety studies. And then we also have our biologics CMC development. So CMC stands for chemistry, manufacturing, and controls. So this is kind of assessing the chemical characteristics of the drugs and making sure that when we're manufacturing them, we have a high quality and consistent manufacturing process that's gonna always produce the same product every time. So within biologic CMC development, we have a group that focuses on the production of the active biological um, ingredient, so the protein. So they help produce um, the cell lines that are then secreting that protein um, for the uh, whatever the recombinant protein product is. And we also have a group that works on formulating the drug product. So taking that protein ingredient and then formulating it into the product that's gonna be given to patients or in clinical trials. And we also have groups in all of these organizations that focus on analytical testing. So a lot of the people in our analytical research and development groups have chemistry backgrounds. Um, they run a lot of um, like HPLC and different types of chromatography to help us determine the presence of the compounds that we're looking for. Similarly to biologics, over on the small molecule side, we also have a CMC development group. So this is the organization that I'm part of. And it's kind of a similar structure where we have people that work on the active pharmaceutical ingredient. So on small molecules, typically this is chemical synthesis. So we're not um, producing the product from cells. And then we also have the uh, drug product development, which is the formulation development. So that's where I work. So the ingredients that go into the pr product that's going to be given to patients, as well as sometimes the manufacturing process, because that can be really key depending on what type of product it is. Um, additionally, um, in slightly less um, scientific or hard, hard like lab science roles, we have a group that works on um, strategy and portfolio. So this is kind of more of a strategic and advisory group that um, focuses on 
um, essentially decisions on which, which projects are prioritized and where resources are given, as well as they help with regulatory submissions. So sometimes these people um, previously worked as lab scientists and then they transitioned um, out, of the, out of the lab and kind of into a more um, guidance role. So oftentimes those people have more experience, they're not necessarily entry level. And that group also works on um, evaluating um, smaller companies that we have the potential of licensing and developing their technology. So say we're gonna um, develop a technology that a small company has um, um, thinks is promising, but they don't have the resources for, um, we can license it from that company and use our resources as a, as a larger company to help get that product to the market by going through the clinical trials and everything that is necessary for regulatory approval. Within DevSci, we also have our clinical supply um, management group. So this helps um, manage over 300 clinical trials that are currently ongoing within our company. So this involves the manufacturing of all those clinical supplies, the um, packaging, warehousing, and distribution all across the world to wherever these clinical trials are currently happening. So this can be scientific and unscientific roles depending on what they are. We also have business operations, so more like operational support, finance, communication, as well as scientific compliance. So training for employees, um, making sure that our lab systems are qualified in whatever way they need to be. And we have our environmental health and safety group, which involves um, lab safety, occupational health, um, dangerous goods, and just in general, uh, making sure our workplaces are safe places to be and that all employees have the necessary training that they need. And then finally, within DevSci, we have engineering and scientific support. So this includes um, stock rooms and supplies, making sure that all of our equipment is calibrated so that it can be um, accurate for all of the experiments that are done, um, as well as capital sourcing and different types of project management for uh, lab renovations and those kinds of things. So that kind of covers the different areas within DevSci. Um, like I said, this is just one small part of the R&D organization, which is a small part of the broader ABD organization. So it's a very large company. Um, if you're interested in applying, I would say that most people within DevSci as an entry level, especially for a graduate student, enter as a scientist. Um, so those are people that are typically either working on computational science or hands-on lab science. Um, there's several different levels that would be um, like qualified for entry level master's and PhD students. So if you're a master's student with um, no previous work experience in the, uh, this field, typically you would want to look for um, positions that are posted as an associate scientist too. So the way that our levels work is you move from associate scientist to scientist to senior scientist. So there's um, smaller jumps between those levels, but you kind of advance along that path as you get promoted or you have more experience. So associate scientist too generally is for people that have a master's with zero experience. Sometimes scientist one roles are also looking for that level as well. And then if you're graduating with a PhD, typically you're gonna wanna look for senior scientist or senior scientist one position. So that's the level that I was hired as, as a new grad PhD. Um, we also have some internship and co-op um, programs. You can find those just by Googling AbbVie internships or those kinds of programs. It's a little hard to find from our direct website, but if you Google it, it's very easy to find. So the internships are typically just over the summer and that requires you to still be enrolled in your degree program at the same time. So there are some internships for graduate students, but you would have to be able to take the summer off from school. Whereas the co-ops are six months long, and so you would have to be able to take um, at least one semester off from your school program, but still be um, like have some more education to complete after the co-op is, is over. If you're going to be um, done with your PhD, we also have some limited postdoc positions available. So typically these are, I would say, one to two year postdocs that then you have potential of being hired as a full-time employee afterwards. But we definitely do hire 
um, people that have a PhD um, with no postdoc, um, like straight from PhD to industry. So I would say um, when you're looking at job descriptions, all of our jobs can be found on careers.abby.com. It's very easy to find. But um, even if you don't fully match the desired years of experience for a role, I would say that the technical experience is really the key. So if you have um, certain techniques that it's looking for and say you don't quite meet the years of experience that they want, I would suggest still applying for the position and you might luck out or maybe they're not super strict on the exact level of the job and they could adjust it for a good candidate. Um, additionally, um, making sure that you have really good communication skills is very important because since we're such a big company and we're communicating across sites, it's really important that people have good both written and verbal communication skills. Also, um, leadership skills. So if you have any leadership experience um, from your time as an undergrad, as a graduate student, highlighting that on your application resume, I think is, is key. It can show that you have initiative to take those leadership um, roles and also um, just you're putting yourself out there for that. Um, additionally, I think that as, since most people um, that come to Abbey as a fresh, fresh graduate student, um, they are gonna be in technical roles, really um, highlighting the research experience that you have is gonna be key because they're looking for people that are gonna be doing lab research. So they wanna see what kind of research experience you have. So being in a research focused degree, I think is key to having a chance at getting interviewed. But I'm happy to take more questions when um, we get to that part of the panel. All right. Very good. Thank you so much, Heidi. We're going to turn it over now to uh, Devin from the MacArthur Foundation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Thank Cindy. You. Um, I, uh, I want to start just a little bit of, of background about myself. Um, you know, my, my path to philanthropy was kind of a winding one. Uh, I had spent time in HR roles in higher ed, uh, manufacturing, uh, financial services, but I was really longing for, uh, you know, to, to kind of be in an environment where I could see the direct impact of my efforts. Um, I thought I had hit the jackpot when I found my way into to healthcare. Uh, I was thinking to myself, well, what better way to see my impact than hiring people who were, you know, out here saving lives? Um, it wasn't until I was approached with the opportunity to have recruitment for the MacArthur Foundation that I realized how much bigger of an impact I could make working for an organization that's tackling some of the world's biggest challenges. Uh, I'll be honest, I, I hadn't heard of the MacArthur Foundation until that LinkedIn message came through. Uh, but after doing my research and, um, you know, having been now with the foundation for three years, joining this, what we call family, uh, was one of the best decisions I've ever made. I, I oftentimes joke that I, I would have, if I would have known that this, this world existed uh, all those years ago, I would have found my way here a lot sooner. Uh, so now I kind of see it as my life's mission to, to spread the good news. Uh, hence why I'm, I'm here with all, uh, all of you today. Um, it, for those of you who, who maybe haven't heard of the MacArthur Foundation, like I did three, like I was three years ago, uh, we are one of the nation's largest independent foundations. Uh, our $8.5 billion endowment provides funding to address some of the world's most pressing social challenges, including climate change, uh, decreasing nuclear risk, um, promoting local and nationwide, or uh, yeah, promoting no nationwide and local criminal justice reform, uh, reducing corruption in Nigeria. And one of our newer programs is focused on strengthening the research and advocacy at the intersection of, of technology and its impacts on society. Uh, we also fund journalism and media. We do impact investing. Uh, as well as my personal favorite is a portfolio we call Chicago Commitment uh, that's focused on, you know, uh, uh, right here on causes that are, uh, you know, impacting folks right here in our backyard, including the arts uh, in Chicago. Uh, the Field Museum actually happens to be one of our, our, our grantees. 
Um, we have a small, what I call small but mighty staff uh, of about 200 people uh, across three different offices. Uh, we have 170 or so do sit in our Chicago headquarters uh, at the corner of Dearborn and Adams. Uh, in the MacArthur, I'm sorry, in the Marquette building, which actually is a historical landmark that we own. Um, and then the rest of our staff sit in offices uh, in Nigeria and India. Uh, what I didn't know before joining the foundation is how much work goes into giving money away. In my mind, I thought, oh, you have all this money, you just give it away. <laughs> but no, there is a lot of work that goes on in, in about 70% of our staff are actually behind the scenes operations folks, op occupying roles that you, know, you will see in most organizations like in IT and finance and legal, um, HR, which we call people and culture, event planning, communications, uh, and then the remainder of those staff are folks that are, are true boots on the ground, pro programmatic uh, folks that are out there making the connections between the foundation's funds and the people and the organizations who need them. Um, I, I didn't prepare any slides today, but I will uh, talk about a few of the type of the roles that we typically see uh, at the foundation. Um, one of those includes program officers. Um, and a program officer um, will typically sit within a program team, and each program team can have anywhere between one and nine of these subject matter experts in a related field or topic. Um, they typically will uh, possess a, uh, a graduate degree or a PhD in a particular field like humanities, journalism, public policy, um, and you know some of the, the various sciences. Uh, and so they'll sit within the program um, and they will use their subject matter expertise to identify and vet the organizations or grantees in need of funding. Uh, they're out in the communities learning more about these organizations, meeting with key stakeholders, government officials, and community leaders. They then take all of that information back and write grant briefs showcasing their findings and ultimately presenting them to our board for approval for funding. Grant amounts could you know, range anywhere between $10,000 and millions of dollars. Um, now, not everyone can start out as a program officer right out of undergrad or out of graduate school. Um, so I always encourage folks to, you know, not be afraid to kind of get your start in a support type of role within a program um, and really utilizing that time to gain the knowledge of the inner workings of the foundation, inner workings of the program itself, um, through you know, setting up site visits and doing budgeting for the grants, um, scheduling meetings with grantees and, uh, and other stakeholders, proofreading those grant briefs, we also have researchers and evaluators focused on the knowledge management and the data analytics that goes into the grant making. Um, so I really encourage folks to really look at it as a place to start and, and because everyone you know, has to start somewhere. Um, we also have a fellows program, which I think is probably one of the most notable areas if anyone has heard of those genius grants. Uh, that MacArthur is uh, most known for oftentimes. Uh, it is the most, I, I would have to say truly one of the, uh, one of a kind. Uh, there is no organization out there doing it like we are here. Um, it's highly respected, often imitated, but never duplica duplicated. Sorry about that. Someone's trying to call me right in the middle of my presentation. So sorry about that. Um, but uh you know, one can either be a fellow um, or work as a program officer within the fellows program, doing the things that I, you know, just mentioned before, uh, but instead of vetting organizations, they're vetting individuals across multiple disciplines who ultimately are rewarded then with an $800,000 no strings attached funding support for them as people. There are no restrictions on what that money can be used for. It could be used towards your research, products for your art projects, or to pay your rent <laughs> and your car note. 
Um, the fellows themselves uh, are nominated by their communities and networks without them even knowing. And over the course of you know seven to nine months, the program officers function kind of like a, a private inv investigator, I guess, if you will, learning more about them to determine if they should ultimately be awarded this funding. Um, we receive hundreds of nominations each year, but only about 20 to 30 are chosen um, as MacArthur Fellows. Um, some of the notable fellows uh, that come front of mind for me include like um, Jean Gang, um, who is an architect who designed the St. Regis Hotel here in Chicago, which is the tallest building in the world designed by a female architect. Uh, Nancy Cartwright actually is a philosopher uh, of science who earned her PhD from UIC. Uh, and my personal favorite, Lynn manuel Miranda, as I am a huge fan of, of Hamilton. Um, so hopefully there are some other folks uh, out there that enjoy Hamilton as much as I do. Uh, and I also want to talk a little bit about um, uh, our internships. And our summer internship program, uh, I think, is a really great way to get exposure into this wonderful world uh, of philanthropy. Uh, each summer, we host about somewhere between 13 and 15 students for an intensive yet fun 10 weeks um, of an immersive experience within many of our various functions, from programs to operations, uh, also, our investments team takes on a couple of interns as well. Um, our recruitment window will actually open in, in the next few weeks here. So I strongly encourage you all to keep an eye out for, on our careers page for those opportunities. Um, you know, our interview window will then start in January with our plans to, you know, solidify our cohort before spring break. Uh, our summer internship program is is fully paid um, and is really it's it's geared towards students both at the undergraduate degree level, graduate degree level, as well as PhD students. Um, you know to really uh, have an opportunity to get an insight look at what you know who we are, what we do, uh, to make a lasting impact on our, our world. Um, our you know, program consists of various social events and outings and seminars, um, and most importantly, exposure to a specific area within the foundation um, and what their work does uh, and how it contributes to our mission. Um, and then I, I wanna close a little bit uh, here of talking a little bit about kind of you know, what it looks like uh, or what success, I guess, looks like for someone, you know, at the foundation and some of the things that we look for um, when we are, uh, you know, interviewing candidates. Um, it doesn't always necessarily mean that you come from a specific background or experience or sector. Um, I came from healthcare, right? And, and I'm working in, in, in uh, philanthropy now. I've recruited people from uh, private equity firms and consulting firms and things like that. So we really do value, um, you know, gaining different perspectives here at the foundation. But I think one of the key things in that common thread that makes it so special here um, is this commitment to the MacArthur mission, right? That mission and values alignment, which is something that you can teach someone. Um, it's, it's not just getting a job, right? It's the job, you know, someone who is really committed to, you know, working towards something bigger than themselves, no matter what their role is. Um, I think it's also important for someone to have, you know, intellectual curiosity, right? People who ask the right questions. They're not afraid to challenge status quo. Um, that's how we continue to be a trailblazer in the work that we do. Um, you know, however, one must also be a life learner, right? Learning from our peer foundations, learning from their individual experience, as well as the experience um, of others. Um, 
And then, you know, lastly, we are a highly collaborative atmosphere here. Um, you know, we uh, really do acknowledge and, uh, you know, and leverage each other's perspective um, and ensuring that, you know, any decisions that are made um, aren't done in a vacuum, right? We, you know, don't have any cowboys here, um, only a village uh, of people all working towards one common goal, and that's to to make our world uh, a better place. Um, so I know I want to be sure because I know we're done at 1.30 and want to be sure that we have time for questions too. So I'll, uh, you know, pass it back over to uh, Cindy and, and Teresa. Again, thank you very much, Devin. I appreciate, uh, again, all of your insight, all the great information. Uh, yes, we do want to open it up to uh, Q&A. Uh, if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, we probably will have time for maybe a, two or three questions. Uh, but if again, if someone wants to unmute themselves, and Teresa will help out with fielding some of these questions as well. This is your great opportunity. So I, I know you have some questions. Go for it. Can I? Should I just go ahead? Yes, please. Hi, I'm Aditi. Thank you so much to the panel for such a wonderful, um, you know, such a wonderful like trove of information. Um, I've made so many notes. Uh, I have a question for Devin from MacArthur Foundation. Um, so I've been looking into foundations and I'm, I really like the kind of work that goes into, you know, finding projects that are like worth funding. I have some um, experience working with um, grants and contracts at UIC as well. And I think one of the questions that I have, um, that I really want to just ask companies is like, are you hiring international candidates? Because um, one of the problems that I've been facing in a lot of my applications is that I think, um, you know, every time I sort of answer the question of do you need work authorization as yes, I feel like that eliminates me from the poll. Um, and so I've been really like kind of coming up against this uh, over and over again. And I understand like the market is terrible. So I get like, prioritizing, you know, citizens over uh, international candidates. But this, I mean, I also love that like MacArthur has, uh, you know, an office in India, like that's, you know, where I eventually want to be as well. So like, yeah, that's my question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Thanks so much for that question, Aditi. And yes, you're right. And as, it, as challenging as it is for an international student to find, uh, you know, opportunities here in, in the States, it's just as challenging, I think, for organizations too, right? To be able to put in the, the work that goes into navigating immigration and, and things like that here in the US. And so the foundation's perspective, we're all about diversity, right? Um, our, our DEI is really embedded into everything that we do. And one of the things that I really pushed for last summer was this ability to hire and bring on international students for our summer internship program. Um, and so I was fortunate enough to be able to plant that seed and it grew. And we were able to bring on three international students last summer um, you know, to to uh, during our summer internship program. Um, now, where it gets tricky is full time employment um, because we um, have not embarked on this journey to consistently provide the sponsorship for visas. Um, which is tricky for us. Um, however, it is not a door that is completely shut. Um, I think for the right candidate, um, especially if it's a a, a niche. Um, kind of skill set or position um, that we are unable to identify local U.S. based talent for. Um, we have seen some exceptions to that rule um, in the past. So um, the door is not shut, uh, but we definitely want to, uh, you know, be sure to keep that conversation going, especially if it's the right person, you know, for for the role. Thank you. Could our other panelists address that same question? Do you also have opportunities or not? So <laughs> the answer is, I think it, it might be a little um, complicated. So in, in scientific research, um, you know, particularly if you're going to get, let's say something like a scientist position, um, being international doesn't really matter in many ways. Now, at the same time, it's a DOE lab. And so there are certain countries that are, you know, I think it would be particularly challenging to become a full-time employee 
but in general, um, like I said, it's so international. They have a whole office dedicated to visas and all sorts of stuff like that. So, um, and there's certain, again, certain normal exceptions to the rules for or scientific, you know, it has its own parallel path that makes it easier a lot of times, depending on the job. I believe AbbVie is similar, especially for scientist roles. They they will sponsor people, but it it depends on the individual candidate. Marie, I think a similar answer. I know that we have international scientists, um, but I am not personally involved in that process. Okay, all right, great. And we do have a hand up from is it Tomi? Yes, Tomi. That's my name. Yes, Thanks. please um, uh, ask your question. Okay, so my question is from Heidi um, from Habvi. Um, and my question is, I am currently a first year PhD student of computational biology. And even though I do so much um, high performance computing, I do it on plant transcriptomics. So I'm always just thinking, oh, okay, even though I really want to work in biotech, because I work with plant data, can that be um, a deterrent because you folks, work more on like chemicals for drugs and stuff. So yeah, that's my question. I don't think that that would be a deterrent at all. Um, having those types of computational skills, at least in my opinion, I don't do that type of work, but those types of skills I think would be transferable to any sort of computational work, yes. Um, okay, and lastly, does, um, so for computational biology, there are positions for internship here in Chicago? Um, there likely will be. I don't 100% know what the internships will be, but I think that most of them for summer 2024 will be posted in the next couple of months. So there are some that are already posted, but not within the R&D organization. I think the R&D internships will mostly be po posted by early 2024 for the summer. So keep checking. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thanks for your questions, y'all. Um, I see something from Ivan in the chat, and then I want to kind of a follow up to that. I think to all of our panelists. So, Ivan asked, um, as a it's coming out of grad school, what should what should you expect your salary to be, um, and or should we put a lower salary than we really want to get hired? So that's number one. And my question is, I heard about leadership skills, about considering different things than you would maybe consider in graduate school for a position connecting to missions and values, communication skills, and really being able to work on a team. I heard those things coming from the different panelists. But I'm wondering, do you see any mistakes that maybe graduate students make applying for positions that maybe they're like, oh, no, they shouldn't have done that, or they shouldn't have said it that way, or maybe like, industry language is different than grad school language, maybe do it this way. So in general, have you seen anything maybe that maybe grad students do that you would say, hey, don't do that, like do it this way, or just another tip or suggestion for something folks should do. So those, sorry to throw those out. I know we only have a couple of minutes, but anybody that <laughs> wants to answer. I would say this is, again, mostly working with undergrads, but I think it could apply. I think I see students leaving out what I would consider relevant experience related to activities and hobbies um, because it's work skills. Um, so sometimes things will come out in the conversation when I ask my questions that they never put on their resume. Um, so that would be one. That was a two-parter. What was the first half? Now I'm forgetting. <laughs> um, intro, I think it was, Ivan was asking salary. about intro oh. salaries and should you put a lower salary yeah. to get hired? So for the museum industry, it's interesting. I started to type an answer. Um, in the museum field specifically, there's actually a movement right now to both eliminate that question and to put um, salaries listed in job listings. Um, the transformation is not complete, um, but there's a lot of outspoken um, pressure um, on like when I listed the um, the big organizations, AAM, Aztec, et cetera, to like not list things unless they have that. So my first thing would be, it's, I mean, it's obviously not complete, so you will definitely still run into it. I mean, I would say some blend between doing your research and trying to put something that's typical and being honest, you know, would be my guess, or hopefully if something's listed a range, you know, put something in the range. Mostly when I've been aware of people paying attention to that, it's eliminating, trying not to waste someone's time is, but I, I mean, I personally think that should be eliminated. I don't think that serves anyone. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I, I'm with you, Marie. The I don't want to waste anyone's time and I don't want anyone's time to be wasted. So we put all of our salaries on our job description. So before you hit that apply button, make sure that number aligns with what you're looking for. There is no world in which we can just fall in love with you and adjust the salary by $50,000 just because we fell in love with you. That's <laughs> not, it's not a thing. It's not going to happen. It's there for a reason. Um, so be honest with yourself of, of how much you are willing to accept because it's, it's advertised there for a reason. Um, and just real quick, a mistake that I, I've uh, seen, um, and specifically in the world of philanthropy, we are really big on cover letters. And so it, what we don't, what we typically look for in cover letters are people who have taken the time to tailor it to the job and the organization. Really make sure that you showcase why this organization why this job, not just some blanket. Well, these are all the things that I do great. It's like, why this role? Why this organization at this time? Uh, because again, like I said, the, the values and mission alignment, we can't teach and we can't assess whether you have it if you don't tell us, right? Um, so just want to throw that, that tidbit out there. Do not underestimate the value of a cover letter because we take them very, very seriously here at the foundation. That was the other bit I was going to say is related to that. I get a lot of cover letters where I feel like way too much real estate has been devoted to how much they loved going to museums as kids and how much they love museums. And it's not unique. Every single cover letter to a museum job starts out with how much people love museums. It's just a popular place. So I think it's more, um, it's, I know, obviously it's a function of a business where people enjoy the business. Um, but just being mindful that like, um, making sure that you very quickly pivot to like how you see yourself wanting to improve museums or how you see yourself impacting museums or how you want to like bring museums forward or something like that. Um, just sort of declaring your love and enjoyment of museums will not make you stand out. I love that. It's like the favorite quote on a statement that students all write a, the same three quotes. <laughs> <laughs> Heidi or Jason, did you have any responses uh, to that uh, before? Yes. We... So, um, okay. So again, my, my personal background is the, the particle physics research, which is very, fairly specialized. So to tr sort of directly answer the question, um, typically coming out of, you know, once you get your PhD, you become what's called a postdoc. Um, the official title will be some sort of research associate. Um, typically that's about 55 to probably about 75,000 these days. Um, your labs tend to pay more than universities, um, and there's going to be a large range because cost of living is all over the, <laughs> the place, depending on where you end up. Um, and the labs just on average typically do better. But even then, it's going to depend on, I think, what um, part of the organization you're actually working for. Um, and again, it, it you know research becomes very specialized very fast. So like in my own personal case, uh, when I became a postdoc, this was at a different um, national lab. This is Brookhaven National Lab. Um, you know, it, you know, in practice, it had a lot to do with the fact that I worked with the, the guy running the, the hiring um, on an experiment before, right? Because, you know, I was doing muon physics and I was going to continue to do muon physics and there's not many people doing muon physics in the world. So the fact that I caught his attention is not a surprise. So I don't know how useful that is, but I think that's often a common theme in science is you naturally transition into people you've sort of worked with or clo in your close knit community because they're all close knit communities. Do your, do your networking, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> well, awesome. Well, I know we're hitting uh, time. I know, Heidi, I don't know if you have a last sentence or anything uh, before we go. And I'll throw it back to Cindy to close us out. I don't really have a specific anything else. There's one more person with a question we could probably take if that's okay. okay. Yeah, what time? We're at two over. If we maybe really quick, Mohammed, if you have a quick question, go ahead. And then we're going to, we're going to have to close up. Yes, uh, my question is like when you apply for a job, you will have uh, your qualification and responsibility you read through to see if you're suitable for the job. Now, how you can like consider the qualification, uh, some of qualification void, uh, like if you want to apply to the job, you don't have all the qualification, but you know that if you get the job, you'll do better job. So how do you know if you send the application? application uh, your application will be accepted or be ignored because you don't have the enough qualification like what can you do to make up for that 
So in should opinion, you should I you apply for something if you don't have all the qualifications? Is yes, that... but you like you know you have the experience, okay. but like uh, you don't have the qualification, like the license. The... Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. Someone want to? I answer? think it's I think it's kind of a balance. Um, if they're looking for like specific techniques or stuff like that, that's going to be part of your daily job. It might be a little hard to get that opportunity if you don't have that experience in the past. Um, if it's um like a license or something like that it could depend if the company is willing to work with you towards that um i think if you have some of them and not all of the qualifications i would recommend applying but if you only have like one out of a whole list of like 20 it might be less likely kind of a percentage sort of thing no, I'm talking like and keep an uh, eye out for those required right words after the the yeah. bullet point. If it says required and you don't have that, mm, that might be a bit of bit of a stretch. But highly preferred, highly desirable. If you don't have it, throw your head in the ring. What's the worst that can happen? They say no. At least you it you may you gave it a shot. All right. Well, now just thank you so much for, for your questions, everyone. Um, and I want to throw it back to Cindy uh, for our closing. Uh, what a wonderful slew of advice. I learned something about my future yes. career thing I want to do. So Cindy, take it away for our closing. Sure. Again, thank you so much, panelists. Fantastic information. Uh, and, and I know there are no more questions popping up, but we do want to respect everyone's time. It is uh, 134. So again, thank you so much. I did put my email in the chat. If there are some burning questions, I'd be happy to, you know, take your question. If I don't have the answer, I will forward it on to the panelists. Maybe they can then follow up as well. Uh, and uh, Teresa just put in her email as well. So we're going to wrap up again. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. Fantastic audience attendees, panelists, everybody. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening, a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Seven. Thanks, Jason, Marie. Heidi, thank you. Cindy, are you staying on for a second? Yeah, I can. Let's stop. <laughs>